What's the official definition of deja vu? I don't know. If it's devil you officially. It's, I yeah. think the devil is out to get us today because this is. I know. This I is know. One it, of many takes. Yeah. You are talking to the technophobe though, but I don't know what's I'm becoming on. a technophobe after. <laughs> well, let's see. After who we speak to today, I might go become a Luddite, move further up the mountain here and go, go hide in the woods because I'm genuinely concerned about some of the things that we've read about our guests coming up today, but let's introduce them a little bit. So Sarah, how do you know Daniel and what is Daniel going to talk about? So Daniel's an EMF expert, which is electromagnetic fields. And this is something that I'm passionate about because obviously I'm a bit obsessed with keeping a good brain. And one of the main things that I'm worried about is like wearing headphones all the time, looking at my phone all the time, looking at the computer. And I do use some of the products. He has a company, Deventer Shield, which I use the product. So I'm generally interested to have him on to explain the science because actually it's not widely known. You know, it's very difficult to integrate physics into biology because it's just not done. It, they're two yeah. sciences that hardly ever meet. But in order to understand the biology, you need the physics. So I'm hoping right. he's a mechanical engineer. I'm hoping he's going to be able to bring us up to speed. I'm excited and also scared. Sarah, you know, there is so much to be grateful for. And one thing I'm grateful for is the technology when it works, <laughs> when it works. When it works. We've yeah. had our struggles, but um, there you go. We're getting there. We're winning. We're winning we are, we are winning. Tech. There is someone out there trying to stop season three from being heard, but we will not let them stop season three from being heard. I'm grateful you're here. I'm grateful you yet again brought another amazing guest. Should we jump into the guest, get going? Yeah, I think we should get going. I mean, I'm very excited. We we have Daniel from Deventer Shield to talk to us today. And this is one of my topics that's very close to my heart, because as you know, I'm I'm constantly telling you about wearing your headphones, about EMFs, about all of these things that are going on. But I think having an expert on to explain, you know, why and the science behind that's going to be invaluable. So, hi, Daniel. Thank you so much for coming on. Well, Sarah, and you too, Russ. Thanks for inviting me on. I really appreciate it. It's great to meet you. It's our pleasure, I'm sure. So, Daniel, I I have a question because I think it's hard for the like everyday person to understand like what devices are bad, what's causing all of these things, you know, on the back of a lot of your devices, you have all these little symbols that the electronics companies are supposed to like tell you and the tech companies are supposed to tell you, are there ways for you to identify these devices that are potentially dangerous to you so you can put them far away? I'm just curious if there's an easy way to say, okay, wireless things, let's not have them on your head for 20, you know, 20 hours a day. Uh, cell phones, keep them away. Are there things we should, are there devices we should keep at a distance from? No, there's not a list that clearly states what is dangerous and what may not be dangerous. But let's talk a little bit about it. And a cell phone, anything that transmits out a cell phone, it has Wi-Fi transmitters, Bluetooth transmitters, and cell phone transmitters. The rule of thumb is, if you don't need it on, turn it off. I talk about it as bees in the room. One bee will kill a thousand, one bee won't kill you a thousand will. Mm -hmm. So the idea is reduce the environment, the ambient within the room. And the more you reduce it, the more likely you are to have uh, less impact to this body and the cells of the body distances. If you have a cell phone to your head, 1.6 watts per kilogram penetrates a six-year-old child by fall all the way through. If you move it one to two foot away, just one to two foot, 80% of that danger to that child's gone. By four foot, 98%. 
So when you're really, really close to stuff, that's when it's dangerous. So the rule of thumb is turn it off if you're not using it. Simple thing to do. And if you're going to use it, watch the duration of time, not too long. And when not using them, you certainly should push them at least four foot or more away. And if you have a router next to your desk, that's the worst thing you can do, Russ. <laughs> How about sitting on it? How about sitting on a router? <laughs> you want a router at least 10 foot away? And, yeah, 10 um, feet away? It's at right least okay. 10 feet okay. away? And that's conservative. Yeah. I'm going back. <laughs> yeah, about, I mean, that was about five foot. <laughs> My, oh. Mine is right here, but I do turn mine off every night. The thing is, I turn mine off every night, but I live in a top floor flat. What's my neighbor underneath doing? They're probably right. 10 feet, but not, you know, I'm probably sleeping on top of a router because they've got theirs on downstairs. So it's it's very uh, difficult it's, it's, to get away from it. No question. But there are rules of thumb there, too. Worry about the stuff that's around you. Right. Yes. So the I fact that, that you, yeah, yeah, you, it, we, by turning it off, you really do reduce the ambient in the in room. Never have routers, cell phones, tablets that are transmitting in a bedroom. And I can go on and on around about the circadian rhythm and the, and the melatonin not being created because of the influence of the RF signal. It absolutely interferes with the body, particularly the mental. If you're extremely electric hypersensitive, for example, you're walking around and your brain is sleeping and it can be where you're sleeping and your brain's walking around, beta versus other forms of uh, wave forms. That is literally being created by the influence of an RF signal in the environment you're in. And that is a classic case of impact to electromagnetic radiation exposures to the electrically hypersensitive. So is there, um, is there data for that, Daniel? Is there like studies that are being done yes. on brain waves? Yeah. And you know, it's funny, I was on a podcast talking to a really, really bright lady, and I said, get that stuff out of your room. It influences the sleeping pattern. And without the circadian rhythm, the mitochondrial repair and all that kind of other stuff that has to happen won't happen. And she was saying, oh, oh, thank you so much for that information. And she didn't believe a word I said. And so like several weeks later, she called me up and she said, my husband and I took our cell phones out of our bedroom. We're sleeping throughout the night. So she says, you're absolutely right. And it is true for some of us. It a lot for most of us it's not you yes. know but for there's a percentage as i said truffle 20 percent, that have some sort of reaction to the environment because specifically of electromagnetic radiation i'm going to depart a tiny bit talk a little bit about the other form of electromagnetic radiation light believe it or My not <laughs> There are LEDs in the monitor you're looking at right now that are generating light into the environment, right? And so ultraviolet light is literally where non-ionized radiation converts to ionized radiation. And ionized radiation is like an X-ray. If you keep the X-ray on too long, the cell will disrupt the cell to the point where it knocks out the electron orbit and charges the electron. And that's why it's so dangerous. It can kill you very quickly and everyone knows it for, for life on end. It turns out non-ionizing radiation also can be dangerous in time and science beginning to understand what those mechanics are as we've been talking about a little bit now. But the cusp of that is ultraviolet light. Blue light, it's right next to it. So yeah. when you're sitting and you're looking at a monitor, a laptop, a tablet monitor, before you go to bed at night, what's going on? The back of the eye is looking at light that says it's light out. And there's a little cryptochrome protein that's in the back of the eye. That is the little switch that turns the melatonin on and off. So when you're looking at a tablet, and then you decide to go to sleep. The reason you can't go to sleep is because the cryptochrome switch didn't go on. 
and the mitochondrial, this was the, the melatonin wasn't created in that cycle, and it takes the time to fall asleep. It interferes with the sleeping pattern to the extent where it disrupts the whole cycle of yeah. sleep. It's not just the doom scrolling. It's not just the scrolling, and, and that's what keeps you awake. It's literally the device is transmitting right. and keeping literally. you awake. Wow. Right. Yeah. Literally. It's, it's a triple whammy, really, isn't it? Because it's the blue light toxicity and the non-native EMF and probably the toxic content that you're looking at if you're kind of just, you know, mindlessly <laughs> yeah. looking at, or, you know. Especially late at night. Especially late at night. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you actually make a really pretty good point. I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way, but the path to the brain is through the eye. Mm. It's almost this non-disruptive. It goes right through very readily. So if your room environment in your bedroom, for example, is high, electromagnetic radiation levels, there's a flow through your eye. So it's not just the blue light, as you point out. It's mm -hmm. also the EMF in the room. That's right. I'm more curious, too, around are there things that you can use to prevent some of this? Like, are, are there, you know, can I put a giant lead blanket on my daughter while she has the laptop on her lap? Like, are there things that we can do to prevent that? I mean, you can't stop a child from grabbing the electronic. I mean, I can watch over her constantly. What do we do? So, Russ, a point of fact, when you have ionized radiation, the way you shield ionized radiation is with lead. It turns out you can't shield ionized radiation with lead. You have to use other metals to do that. So there are ways of creating shielding, and that's in the market. But I always tell everyone, you really first need to understand your environment and manage that environment. If you do a good job of moving stuff away, turning stuff off, putting a router in the back corner of your home, not in the office space you're in, it will never bother you. Yeah. But when it's close to you, as we've talked about, it can. So it's a matter of putting stuff away, duration of time, the amount of time you use it, duration of time you use it, all of those things influence. The last result is, in fact, finding sh products that can actually shield. And that, yeah. that exists in the marketplace. Sarah, what was that? You just held that. I have, well, because my family all think I'm nuts, actually, because I go around turning off all their machines and doing things. But my mum is very supportive of whatever I'm doing. And so she's made me these little shields for everything. Yes. Yeah. So because in because obviously I can't turn everything off in the house, but this goes on the telephone when no one's using it because it's got, I've yeah. got an apron. I actually these are Defender Shield headphones that I wear that. Well, I'm sure Daniel can tell us a lot more about it, but the they just have a wire. The wire only goes to here, the electricity I see. Here, of course, so I... yeah. I'll, I'll tell you why I created them, Sarah. You know, remember I said a cell phone is 1.6 watts? We know a cell mutates at dot one watts, mm -hmm. 15 times less the power level in the frontal lobe. So if you are hypersensitive in any way, there was influence to the frontal lobe when you use Bluetooth. Even when you use yeah. wired phone, earphones, there was still an escape from those wires that could influence the frontal lobe. So mm -hmm. what I did was I took the wire and I converted it to an acoustical uh, signal, which is just audio. Mm -hmm. And I eliminated the potential for any impact to the upper part of the body. And it is always, by the way, the soft tissue that is exposed the most. Breast tissue, brain, groin tissue. You're never going to die of cancer of the hand from electromagnetic radiation. It doesn't exist. It's the soft tissue you're typically washing. I was going to, Daniel, I swear, I swear to you, I was going to ask that question. <laughs> was like, How about my hands? These hands, your hands are built for, they're pretty tough things, huh? Your hands. We make right, exactly. Yeah, we're tough. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to start wearing Sarah's shields on my hands. <laughs> but Sarah, it is possible to shield. And what you are doing is literally going where the source is and shielding it. And that's that there's a, many products that can do that for you. And there, it's actually, from a conservative point of view, it's conservative. You may or may not believe it's dangerous, but 
conservatively, you can minimize those exposures by minimize doing simple risk. things. Yeah. yeah, minimize the risk. Minimize and the- let's talk about the real exposures. I mean, I, I wow. haven't spoke about this, but this is a very controversial subject matter, as you may know. And there were thousands and thousands of studies on what happens to the cell, to the body from exposures, but they're not statistically significant. In other words, they don't have 10,000 people and they can say with the probability of 95% accuracy that this is true. So we've never had enough science. And look, we're not gonna take 10,000 kids and lock them in a room and radiate them and see who dies. So it's not, we do in science, right? And so it really has been difficult to find data. But a couple of years ago, actually 10 years ago or so more, there was a Ramazani Institute out of Italy, which did an epidemiology study of the largest size populations that statistical significance could be determined. And they found elevated increases in frontal lobe cancer and heart cancers. And that was real. NTP, National Toxicity Program, which is the U.S. federal government, they spent almost $30 million. They came up with the same conclusions as the Ramazani Institute or vice versa. And so there is growing evidence, substantiated evidence, that there is those kinds of links. I think the problem is doing the, doing the study for the, the length of time. Because, you know, I, I've been involved in clinical trials and a lot of studies, and they're normally three months or six months, and if you're lucky, you can maybe get a year. You know, yeah. so, but this is something, this is being repeated for a lifetime for, for the children. I mean, we've exactly. kind of, at least we've had a little bit of a repeat right. in our childhood. Exactly. But the kids being born now, it's continuous. Yeah, that's such an important point, Sarah. It turns out there was recently a release of a study And the population they were studying was mid to senior women. It was done between 1996 to 2001, Mm -hmm. a five-year interview in a time where their friends didn't have cell phones. So the use of that was very low. And so I commented on the study and I said, you can't derive accurate data on impact to use with such a small time window and with a population that doesn't use it as Mm -hmm. much as the other populations use it. Fundamentally different use patterns. And it's the ones that have heavy use, as I mentioned before. And And it's it's not consistent. Uh, I mean, it's not a single device as well. I mean, you're adding more and more things into your home. You're upgrading. I mean, Apple's pretty good at telling you to upgrade and like, you have no idea, like that upgrade, that processor is faster. Does it mean it's going to be pressing out more cells into the home? Yeah, I think it's probably really hard to do that. So it's on you. I mean, so, you know, Sarah and I spend a lot of time on the podcast talking about being aware and kind of having the quantified self. There are no ways to measure this. There's no way to measure how much of this is going into your body, which is a little scary. Right. You can get an RF meter, Russ, that I do also. Can you? And carry around. Yeah, I do. I carry a Cornet. RF meter. So if I go into a hotel room, you know, I kind of wave it around. And if it's, you know, it's bright. Well, you're you know, extreme, like, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah, yeah. Sarah's going to be here. It. Sarah's going to be here with all the mold when we're all gone. She's going to be here with all the fun. We, we talked yeah, to a mold most, expert the other day. Yeah, it's like Sarah yeah, and the fun guy are going to be around being like, I told you also. She's just going to be, I told you so. I told you so. But okay, so great. But are those, I mean, maybe we should start putting those on our phones. Yeah, that's what they should, but then the phones are causing the problem. You need something. Yeah. I mean, we should hold, hold some response. I mean, they, they, you know, they don't really hold themselves responsible for addiction to your phone. They do this thing like, you've been on your phone seven hours this on average yeah. this week per day. It should be like, you got this much radiation to your brain, this, the, you know, on average. Right. There is, there is no formal way of doing that, but they are in the U.S. And so there's some attempt to try to reduce exposures in some parts of the world. And it differs in other parts of the world. Sarah, I want to talk about something you probably want to talk about, and it's oxidative stress. I hate the word oxidative stress because it talks about 
the imbalance of free radicals and antioxidants, right? And essentially is oxygenation of the body, right? Yeah. So, but I hate it because it doesn't describe what happens to the body. It just says there's a state that the body gets into and it's an imbalance, which is not necessarily the case. What I've been looking at is cell danger response. Uh, cell danger response is where there's a fight or flight response, which is purely natural in the human body when there's a toxic exposure, including right. electromagnetic radiation. If you start thinking about it in that way, you actually now can understand the mechanics of the body and how it's reacting. So in my view, the study work from Dr. Navio, who's been doing this work, really is beginning to understand what it is far beyond the cell being penetrated by calcium as the source of the problem. I sort of wanted to mention that to you because that's something you may want to look into it because he's doing extraordinary work in my opinion. He talks about not only how the cell reacts, but within the cycle, the 24 hour cycle, there's yeah. differences in things yes, that- of course. It matters right. when you get the stress as well as the stressor that you have. Right, exactly. Timing so, is very important. Yeah, and so that's why I hate oxidative stress. It doesn't tell you anything. No, um, and to be honest, it's a double-edged sword because some a low level of stress can actually be good for the cell. You know, low level stress is actually, they call it hormesis. You know, it's right. actually how things grow. But there comes a tipping point right. where it becomes detrimental. But people don't really know where that is, you know. And yeah, like you said, there are so many variables. So, yeah, oxygenation, good or bad, really depends on time, person. Right. State, it's cell. all about it, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. So, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about something else about electromagnetic radiation. Dr. Ali Johansson, his whole science study has been around electromagnetic hypersensitivity. And he talks about how it impacts the immune system. It suppresses immune. Mm -hmm. And so we know from his work that there are clear breakdown patterns with the immune itself to the extent where your blood brain barrier is reduced, by the way, when you have a cell phone to your head all the time. What, is the cell, what does that barrier do for you? It protects the cells of the brain. I mean, that's what it does. And then over time, it gets worse and worse and worse with their immune systems, including impacting to the source of immune, which is the gut. So now all of a sudden you think you're, you're good and it's only going to bother a cell, but now it's starting to interfere with the processes of the body and then it becomes more unpredictable in that case. So with Dr. Ali Johansson's work, and others, by the way, it's becoming more and more clear that it goes beyond oxidative stress. There are body functions that are occurring and disrupted as a result of these exposures. Which is interesting when you think about, you know, people who have got ill, you know, we've had this recent epidemic and obviously one of the places where people were most affected was New York. And one of the things about New York is you have these massive tower blocks yeah. with people with tons of devices where you really can't escape from it so it just is very difficult to do the study to differentiate what right you and you expect. can't prove it but no. is it true as kids in the classroom they are having they're stressed they're having mental issues they're having in orders of magnitude and they're walking into a room that has dot five watts per kilogram well that five watts is more accurate all day in that classroom. And then as you pointed out, it's all night as well. So behavioral issues that we've been seeing, can we prove that it's related to the toxic environment created by electromagnetic radiation? There has been some levels of proof, but not statistically significant, but certainly with those who have been watching this stuff, there seems to be pretty clear track with the increases of those environments to the conditions happening to the kids. Right. Interesting. Well, poor old Russ. <laughs> poor old Russ. You look 
<laughs> it looks a little bit dejected. I'm all, I'm all every time I'm banging on about the headphones and all the rest. Yeah. Of it. So maybe oh. we ought to end on some top tips because I think. Right, I, on, I, I, I wear these. I, I, I Sarah, Sarah, let me them. go back to what you were saying before. I, yeah. Because I talked about the headsets. Talk about the fifteen percent, but everyone needs to know that one watch is not much power. Yeah. So when you have a Bluetooth in your ear. When you have stereo, this one side connects to the other side through the head, <laughs> through the head. And there are people who are using this stuff for hours, if not leaving it all day. And there is clear understanding of the potential dangers of that, yeah. that people need to be aware of. Yeah. 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 I'm making a brain device at the moment, and that's one of my absolute criteria is with the guys and i'm actually working with a dutch team of engineers they're very very good engineers but they're very serious and i know every time i walk in the room they're like oh god it's it's the team <laughs> hacker that we've got to just a piece but actually you know i gave them the measuring device and they're looking into it and now they're coming to me with those questions because yeah, yeah how do we shield things better and actually the solutions they've come up with are quite simple you know how yeah. do they they can shield the battery. There's things they can do. They can move the power supply. They won't do the Bluetooth, or you can just have it temporarily while you have the app on. You know, there are lots of little. Oh, there's so actually. many things you can actually mm -hmm. do, and you yeah. don't really necessarily have to spend a lot of money to do it. No, uh, no, it's so, just yeah. about knowing about it. And right. like I say, I'm lucky that I work very directly with the manufacturers, so that they can implement it now while it's in the prototype phase. So you know, you don't have the problems where you have to start doing hacks to a device that's already made right i think if the people who are manufacturing devices headphones you know all of these things you know they're the ones that they need to take a responsibility in yeah and really true you do I mean, need to vote with your money and buy the ones that are shielded so with an iphone you're talking about the fine print they say a cell phone shouldn't be closer than three quarters of an inch to the head does anybody use it that way? Of course not. Everyone puts it directly on the head. So even they know that there's some caution benefit by pulling it farther away. But yet it's not something everyone generally understands. And that's what we try to help people understand. Yeah. A little bit of distance is good. A bit on yeah. care, that's what I do. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit unsociable though. You can't do oh, it. Yeah, bus, absolutely. But yeah. you have to. <laughs> you're right. Everyone knows what you're saying, but. Uh, yeah, no privacy, but at least you're not frying your brain. You're right. Yeah. yeah, Russ. It gets frightening. I don't know if anyone's seen Better Call Saul, that show the it's the Breaking Bad <laughs> show that it came before. It's the kind of precursor to, to Breaking Bad. And the brother in the show, he lives in the dark. He wears the blanket. He has no electronic devices in his home, no magnetic devices in the home. I mean, it's very, I mean, he lives his life in fear, right? He's locked in his home. He doesn't go to work anymore. And I could see how this could lead to a lot of people being like, I don't actually know what's safe and what's unsafe. And I'm telling you, Sarah, and I've been doing this for two years now, and there's been a lot of stuff that's scared me and made me nervous. And like, you know, I want to live to be a hundred. I just turned 50 this year. I'm like, okay, I got, this is, this should be my half-life, not like I shouldn't be, right. you know, counting down the, you know, the last 10 years of my life here, but this one scares me the most because I have four children. They're, you know, they are on their devices all day long and nobody takes it seriously. And, and people do think, hey, if they're putting it out and selling it, then it's safe. And it's not true. I mean, you just you mentioned early on about smoking cigarettes. They were selling you ads that you could, you know, you were a, a man's man and a sexy female. If you smoked cigarettes, it killed everybody. It was literally right, exactly. You. It, so absolutely. what do we trust? What do we do? Right. And that's what scares me. Right. I don't know who to, I don't know what to trust anymore. Yeah. Let me reinforce that rush. I work with a clinic that specializes in electromagnetic radiation, and hypersensitivity, and he gets fairly debilitated patients. One in particular I'm thinking about is he came in in a wheelchair. He could not function fully by walking. And so he worked in a very heavy environment where there's was ELF, extremely low frequency stuff, as well as RF. So his was heavy, constant exposure. And um, this clinic 
goes after the brain first and the mm -hmm. brain stem and the day to night night to day patterns they begin working those kinds of things they work at the brain stem because it's communications to the uh, to the uh, body itself and then they go through making sure you're eating right making sure you're exercising right and then making sure you are conservative in how you work within your environment and they begin building up and dealing with the impacts i just so a thyroid if you have fluoride and you have 2.4 gigahertz and a certain mutated cell you're three times more likely to get cancer mm -hmm. so there is fairly well understood scientific evidence that talks about very specific parts of the body and that's what this doctor goes after he goes after the ones that he looks for first being impacted. And that person now is working fine and he's been resilient. He can be exposed and he can still survive. So to the point you were making before, we know of some instances where it can be quite debilitating. So you really do want to manage your environment. No one else is going to help you manage your environment. Sarah right. is in managing hers. You got to start doing it, Russ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. I uh, warning, warning sent, uh, warning heard. Absolutely going to. I think you know, as Sarah mentioned, let's leave with a couple things. One is let's give some tips to people. I mean, I'm I've heard of this, and I'm you know shocked, and I think we know it, but I think we just don't want to. I don't think we understand it. And I think let's yeah, try to, you know, now we have some understanding. Now, what can we do? Should we go to lobbyists on our local state senator who might listen to us and say, can we do something here? Or, and also, what can we do in our homes and for ourselves? To keep okay, ourselves so the FCC, the Federal Communications, literally just lost in court because they don't have standards that are protecting, sufficiently protected, protecting the users. That will continue until i pass away yeah in the meantime you're the owner of your own destiny so you really do need to start thinking about turning stuff on and off as we talked about moving stuff away from you when you're not using it or far away when it's always being used like routers you've got to be aware you don't need a meter to help reduce the exposures in a room all you got to do is think about where they're coming from. Like, for example, if you have a box that takes a wireless connection and connects broadband services to your TV, put an Ethernet connection to it. When you're using a laptop, rather than using Wi-Fi, use an Ethernet connection to it. Make it a physical yeah. wired connection. That all is reducing the environment you're living in. And like what Sarah does, I don't have a great memory. So what I do is I have a timer, a $10 timer on my router. I turn it off at night automatically. And then it turns on automatically. So yep. little simple things you can do really does reduce your exposures and the potential dangers. Yep. And you have to yep. be aware of them. If you're going to use a cell phone or a laptop for long, long period of times, five, 10 minutes or more, you really should think about finding ways of shielding those uses to the yeah. against the body like Sarah does. They are important. Why would you risk it? Right. We already right. know enough about this to think there's something there, whether smoke yeah. there's fire. Yeah. Fascinating and also alarming. So I think that lets you know the alarms go up. Daniel, knowledge you, you, is power, though. That's what we yeah. think. Knowledge is power. It's not about being scared of it. It's okay. Just do these little hacks. Right. Uh, you you own the assuming. problem. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. You this own it. True. Yeah. It, it's I own many scary. of the problem. Yeah. No, it's true. <laughs> it's true. Uh, Daniel, you mentioned early on and may have gotten cut off, but you mentioned you you wrote a book. And yeah. what was the name of that book again? It was Radiation Radi Nation? Radiation Nation. Okay. Yeah. It talks about all the sciences and the we know from a well-documented science perspective we know what the problem is we define what all the problem is we define all the kinds of impacts it can have on you and so the goal was try to give you something that you could read and have a sense of where stuff is with as yeah. minimal biasness as possible 
story. No, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Yeah. And also, just in case we didn't capture this, you mentioned you got started because your wife said to your, you know, you were watching your children with laptops on their laps saying, I want grandchildren. And you mentioned you don't have grandchildren yet. What can we do here? Can we, should we, should we put an announcement out? Something. We need to, grandchildren are the gift. I have four children. And someone had told me the other day, like, I'm getting to the age now where it's like potentially grandchildren, but I'm praying to God, no, I need them to get jobs first. But like, aren't grandchildren the gift? Like, that's the gift we get as being parents is like, yeah. you know, part time yeah. parenting of, you know, getting children. But well, as to that, I did my job. I protected <laughs> the right. farm. Yeah. I've done my job. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You took the laptops off their lap. You told them. All right. Well, amazing. Sarah, I will, I'll let you finish up. Well, thank you. I, I'm just going to say, I just want a little plug for Defender Shield too, because this is a product that I do use, which is one of the main reasons we got you on, because this is a very, very simple hack. I have the headphones, but you have all kinds of other stuff on the website. So thank you for that. And yeah, thank you for the book. And thank you for being a guest on the show. It all just helps raise awareness. So. Thank well, Sarah, you thanks so much for inviting me, Russ. Thank, I really do appreciate it. I'm pretty passionate about this stuff. Yeah. And it's important for us to help people understand. This is not to be scared about. This is not to be worried about. It's just simply be aware of what it is and take actions to what you control. Yeah, Simple well as said. that. Yeah, well said. No. Brilliant. Yeah. 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 Fake. And Daniel, do you have a website or, or anywhere where we can send people? Uh, Absolutely. Defendershield.com is where we have a large cross section of products that protects the human body anytime there's electronics that we use and where we started i built my son's this laptop a defender pad because i'm a mechanical engineer i i sort of tried to figure out what the problem was and and bring a solution and it turned out that the technology that i created was portable to cell phones and other devices. And I remember listening to, the reason why I began expanding it is because there was a 16 year old girl who wanted a cell phone. And there was a story about, she used it for a year and she had frontal lobe cancer within a year and passed away. And I said to myself, my God, I know I can stop that with the technology we have. And then we just kept on building more and more stuff that can be used. If you use stuff around you for a long period of time, take an action to try to protect you with something that can mitigate that signal. Yeah, well said. And thank you for protecting us. I really, I much appreciated. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, we will be getting the book and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll chat to you again. The Rebel Scientist Podcast is a Breaking the Gray production. Hosted by Sarah Turner and Russ Eisenman. Audio production by Dave Visaya and the Podcast Engineers. For more information and for our biohacking shopping guide, visit rebelscientist.com. To hear more incredible Breaking the Gray production podcasts, visit breakingthegray.com. That's gray with an E, breakingthegray.com.